Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows that when the XFL starts, our ratings go way up. Here is the captain. It's because it's crap. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are happy to be featuring Pavement from Foam Brewers. Pavement is a double India pale ale smoothed out with some juicy tropical fruit, including citrus, mango, and passion fruit. ABV, a very deliciously dangerous 8.2% garage grade, four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. And how about a couple of cheers to some of our friends? A big we like your jib to Timmy from that Green Mountain State. And we also have Jamie Gorton, currently living at Fort Lee Army Base in Virginia. Everyone we just mentioned, they went to our website, truecrimegarage.com, and they helped us out with this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-W-R-U-N, beer run for everything true crime. Check out truecrimegarage.com and Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Murder. That is one of the most common cases that we discuss here in the garage. Now, with over 650 episodes of True Crime Garage, we have seen just about everything when it comes to the topic of murder. Murder means the manner of someone's death is a homicide. The cause of that homicide can vary. We have discussed shootings, stabbings, victims who were beaten or bludgeoned to death, some suffocated, drowned, burned, or even dragged by a vehicle. The victims themselves are even more drastically different from one another than the causes of a homicide. Every case is unique. Every victim is different. Be it an innocent victim or a low-life drug dealer, in the end, they are all listed as homicide victims. Most annual crime statistics will typically show that the majority of homicides stem from domestic disputes or they are drug-related deaths. More than one law enforcement official has told me that often the silver lining is that it is mostly criminals killing criminals. But they will also tell you that no murder is justified. But there is a phrase or a term common amongst law enforcement officials, and that term is true victim. A true victim are the kids, moms, dads, brothers, or sisters who either did not know their killers or did nothing to provoke them. This week's true crime story would be much easier for us to tell if it were just another criminal killing criminal story. But it is not. This week's story is about one of those true victims. Little Rosie Tapia was just six years old when she disappeared from her bedroom in the middle of the night back in August of 1995. Rosie lived with her family at the Heartland Apartments at 1616 Snow Queen Place in beautiful Salt Lake City, Utah. This was just one of 75 homicide cases statewide for the year of 1995. Unfortunately, This was a year that saw a rise in the state's homicide numbers. Rosie was taken from her bedroom and dumped into a nearby canal where her body was discovered hours later. Her killer has never been arrested. Now, over 27 years later, her family still seeks justice. They want an arrest. They want you not to just help, but to solve this horrendous crime. From the website whokilledrosie.com, 
The family is asking for people to come forward with any information that might help and be useful in any way. They want to hear from everyone who might have information, but particularly if you lived in the Heartland Apartments in 1995, visited the apartments, or were in the area in the months surrounding the murder, were friends with Rosie or family members, had kids who played on the playground there, or knew kids who did, were familiar with anyone who lived in the apartments, who might have seen someone on the playground or around the area. Help us solve this crime. There is a reward of up to $100,000 in Rosie Tapia's case. Someone, somewhere, has information that can help solve this crime. You may not even know it. No fact is insignificant. No detail is too small. If you have any information, please call 385-258-3313. This number is answered by representatives of the family and not the police. Or you can email whokilledrosie at gmail.com. This is also monitored by family representatives. This phone number and email address will be listed in our show notes. Join us as we discuss Rosie Tapia's case in detail and talk about some cases that share some commonalities with Rosie's case as we search for the man that we call the Barbie doll killer. This is the still unsolved homicide case of Rosie Tapia, and this is True Crime Garage. This was no accident, Captain, but that is certainly what police thought that they were responding to when they arrived on the scene in the early morning hours of August 13th, 1995. The police responded to a call about a missing little girl. The call came in just before 6 a.m., so we have a police car or two on their way to an apartment complex. Back in 1995, These apartments were called the Heartland Apartments, located at 1616 West Snow Queen Place. This is a very large, sprawling apartment complex located in the Glendale neighborhood, just four miles southwest from downtown Salt Lake City, Utah. In the quaint neighborhood of Glendale, we have what is currently named Seasons at Pebble Creek Apartments. Now, they say that they provide residents with the ease and convenience of a central city with a peaceful environment of a residential community. So back in 1995, Captain, they were listed as the Heartland Apartments. Today, if people want to look them up, they are listed as Seasons at Pebble Creek Apartments. These are very nice looking apartments from what I can see. They have four different types of layouts. We're talking one-bedroom, two-bedroom, three-bedroom, all the way up to four-bedroom apartments. But again, this is a large apartment complex. There's 15 buildings, and in some of these buildings, they could vary from 12 units. I saw one unit that I suspect may have up to 30 units, so a lot of people living in this area. Police and law enforcement are going to get a call just before 6 a.m., And they're going to be on the scene relatively quickly. They're on the scene. They're in the apartment. And what they are observing is a open window in a child's bedroom. The Venetian blinds have been knocked to the floor. Mm -hmm. The screen to the window has been removed and is sitting outside of the apartment, propped up against the apartment wall. And doesn't it almost have like a pry mark on it? Correct. But there's a little bit of confusion when police first arrive on the scene. So the apartment itself is what's referred to as a basement level apartment. And there is one window for this bedroom. In the bedroom, we have three children sleeping there. We have six-year-old Rosie Tapia, and we have her two younger siblings. This is a brother and sister. They're twins. 
They're about three, four years old at the time. Underneath the window, from the inside of the bedroom, there is a chest, which is like a, a dresser drawer. When police arrive on the scene, there's a bit of a suspicion from the police angle. They're looking at this and they're wondering, could this child have climbed up on the chest and then climbed out the window? Yeah, that's a possibility. And went wandering around in the middle of the night. Right. Now, the parents are frantic, of course. They are already and have already been searching the neighborhood for their little one to no avail. They are telling police, look, she would not have taken off in the middle of the night. Now, keep in mind, the majority of the time when police show up on scene and we have a missing kid, they're usually just not where they should be, and kids do wander off. Sadly, around 10 a.m., a body is discovered in a nearby canal. This is listed as one of those surplus canals. So this surplus canal would be feeding water into the Jordan River. The body that is found is quickly identified to be that of little Rosie Tapia. And this is around approximately 10 a.m. this morning. So they start looking for her around 6 and around 10 a.m. The body is discovered, but not discovered by police, discovered by a man who was walking or jogging with his dog. And he says that when he first spotted this object floating in the canal, right. he thought that maybe it was a large doll. And this would make some sense because she was found floating face down and she was fully clothed, but only a portion of the body was visible from the shoreline. We know this because he alerts police and it's not until police are over there and we have other people involved that the body is removed from the water at that time they very quickly identify the body to be that of rosie tapia and they send her off to be examined by the medical examiner now this does not change the police suspicions at the time in fact it kind of underlines what they had already suspected and they started to think, well, she probably climbed out the window and for whatever reason, wandered down to this canal. Well, and the canal wasn't that far from her apartment. No, we're talking, this is approximately about a football field to a football field and a half from not just the apartment complex, from their physical, actual apartment that they lived in. Right now, her body's going to be found further away, but it's very possible that she could have climbed out the window walked down, like you said, not that far, had an accident, fell into the canal, and then floated down downstream. Yeah, so we should be clear here, because I don't know that we're giving a great description of this canal or where the body was found. So the canal does, in fact, run directly behind the apartment building that Rosie and her family lives in, okay? But her body is found about a football field and a half from that apartment building. So the canal runs, so her body was found south of their apartment complex. The canal does run directly behind it, and it would be a stone's throw. You know, um, one of us, Captain, could punt a football from her apartment building into this canal. Now, if you go south, south of South Street, nonetheless, you're going to find her body is about a football field to a football field and a half away from her apartment building. So this is all in very close proximity to where she goes missing from. And I can tell you, unfortunately, with personal experience, that this type of situation is not incredibly uncommon. In fact, I know of a situation that took place about a year and a half ago that is so similar to this, it's haunting. But in this situation that I'm talking about, the girl snuck out in the middle of the night, in the wee hours of the morning, in fact, left the home and was known to feed the ducks, have a love for feeding the ducks and the fish at a nearby pond. And unfortunately, they found her body in the pond later that day, and it was a complete accident. Now, with the removal of Rosie's body, Police have not changed their stance on it. They're still looking at this as a possible accident that the girl willingly left her own apartment in the middle of the night. 
Yeah, because what was going on that day was her parents, Rosie's parents, went out for a dinner and to go dancing, and she was being watched by her older sister. So they go out dancing and going out to eat, and they open up, the sister opened up the window just to crack because it was hot. So what law enforcement think is, well, the window was open up a crack. Is it possible that she decided to leave in the middle of the night and then went down to the canal and accidentally fell in and then drowned? What's terrible here, Captain, is after the medical examiner, after they do the autopsy, they contact the police and say, hang on a second. This is a homicide. The injury sustained by this young girl, we could fully know that one, she was sexually assaulted, and two, this is a homicide. Now, the. Well, she was also badly beaten. The cause of death is listed as drowning, but due to the injuries and due to the sexual assault, the medical examiner could confidently say that this is a homicide. So now we have police shifting gears here. And you did say badly beaten. You did say badly beaten. And that is true. The difficult thing here, though, is I've seen this reported so many different ways. And it's reported that there was some kind of blunt force trauma to the body. And it's also been reported that when they pulled her from the canal, that it was not clear and would not have been obvious to anyone to switch this from an accident to a homicide based off of what they were seeing when they pulled her from the canal. It was only once the medical examiner did the autopsy that they had to shift gears. Yeah, my my guess is that there was blunt force trauma to her skull, and they probably just weren't able to see that due to her hair and whatever. Well, we don't know for certain because they've never released the official results of the autopsy. Again, it gets to be difficult because a large amount of those injuries could have been covered up by her clothing. She was found fully clothed when they pulled her from the canal. Let's go through this timeline before the murder and leading up to the body being found in a little more detail. Well, like you always say, the timeline matters, but the devil is in the details. As the captain said... We have Roberto and Luin, who are the parents of six-year-old Rosie Tapia. They are going out on a date night on that night. They have their daughter. They have their daughter, Amelia, who is 18. She will be babysitting Rosie and the four-year-old twins, Robert and Angelica, for the night. Now, around 7 p.m., Amelia drops Rosie off at the park. This park is, it's referred to as a park on some online websites. However, this is simply a small playground area that exists inside the apartment complex and is relatively close to the building that Rosie lives in. And so she takes Rosie to the playground area and does leave her there, which is a little surprising to me given that Rosie's only six years old. It's not so surprising given the very close proximity to the apartment building that they live in. And again, this could be part of some kind of routine. She drops the girl off there, returns to the apartment where she has the two younger kids. And then we have a person who would later be labeled as a good Samaritan because they've not identified this individual who returns Rosie to the apartment. This takes place within about 15 minutes of Amelia taking Rosie to the playground area. This good Samaritan is a male and he arrives at the doorstep of Rosie's apartment with Rosie in his arms. He tells 18 year old Amelia that Rosie was kicked in the back while on the slide that She had slid down the slide and another kid comes down right behind her, kicking her in the back. Very likely an accident, yet Rosie is injured from this. And so this guy says, I carried her home to return her to you. Amelia thanks the man. She's a little surprised by the events, but thanks him and informs him that she will look and make sure that there's no 
severe injuries to Rosie. The weird thing here, and this has always been a strange part of this story, and I don't know what to make of it, Captain. I'm, I'm going to be perfectly upfront and honest with everybody regarding this scenario. According to Amelia, the man who she did not know a good Samaritan says goodbye, Rosie. Right. And what Amelia would later say is she does not know this man. She asked Rosie, did you tell this man your name? And Rosie tells her, no, she did not. Amelia is uncertain how this man would have known where Rosie lived. Again, this is a large apartment complex, and this is not the only playground in this apartment complex. Rosie could have lived in any of those apartments. Yeah, I think it's odd, obviously, that he knows where Rosie lives, but not so odd that might he might have heard her name being called to her on the playground or when he went to attend to her when she got injured, did somebody say her name at that point? To add further suspicion to this story, Amelia says a couple of things. One, Rosie was not crying when the man brought her, carried her to the door, which she thought was a little surprising. Why wouldn't you just walk the six-year-old? Two, she could find no sign of an injury on Rosie, and Rosie told her that she was not hurt. Now, the reason why I say I don't know what to make of this is because I think we have two sides to this story. One, we have Amelia's story where she's saying there's these parts of the story that raised my suspicion level. And especially, of course, after we later learned that Rosie was abducted and murdered, of course, she's going to be suspicious of these different items. I've had a lot of interaction with five, six, and seven-year-old children, and I think anybody that has, talking to you parents out there, I think you'll back me up on this. Children do not always tell the truth, especially when they're trying to get something they want. And we've all experienced how much fun it is to take a child from the playground when they do not want to leave, when they're not ready to leave yet. They will throw a fit. They will make up every excuse in the book why they should be able to stay there. Maybe Rosie was, in fact, kicked in the back, and this guy was just trying to help out. Maybe she did say and tell this man where she lived. Maybe she did tell this man her name. And when questioned by her older sister, thought that maybe I'll get in trouble. if I Maybe I've done something wrong. Yeah, because she could have been told multiple times by her her parents or family members or teachers don't talk to strangers. And so then she was hurt and the stranger comes up and maybe she gave the stranger information and now she feels bad about it. One thing we do know for certain is Amelia does not know who this man is. So that's interesting and that's insightful. But at the end of the day, you could have three different scenarios. You could have a scenario where this man labeled as a good Samaritan could be responsible for her disappearing in the middle of the night and was watching the girl and learned information about her. One investigator had something very interesting to say about the scenario, saying that taking the girl to the apartment could have been a bit of a surveillance gathering intel situation for this perpetrator. If in fact this man was involved in right. the abduction of Rosie Tapia. Yeah. Maybe he was carrying her there to one, verify where she lived and to kind of see once the door opens up who all's in the apartment. What do we got going on? Verify that it is her apartment. So that's an interesting angle, but you could also have the angle where this guy was just trying to help and nothing nefarious was going on with the situation. The problem here, captain remains with this individual being unidentified, even all of these years later. Well, it gets quite complicated. It gets difficult to sort it out. And police move on from this Good Samaritan man, and we'll discuss that in a bit, because at one point, they thought they had identified this man. So in our timeline, before Rosie goes missing, that brings us now to 7.30 or a little thereafter. This is when Amelia prepares dinner for Rosie and her two younger siblings. It's bath time after that, and then we're going to get everybody ready for bed. 
And again, this playground situation, Captain, sounds to me like it was commonplace that she would go to the playground leading up to dinner, bath, and then bedtime. Bedtime that night for Rosie and her two siblings is listed at 9 to 9.30 p.m. Let's get back to the abduction and murder of Rosie Tapia after this quick beer break. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Captain. Let's go through a story that ran in the Salt Lake City Tribune September 10th, 1995, because this provides us with the most thorough breakdown of our timeline here. And we're going to go back and revisit some things as we go through this timeline. So before the murder, Rosie's mother, Louine Tapia, and her father, Roberto Tapia, went dancing at the La Frontera Cafe and Bar the night of Saturday, August 12, 1995. As we said earlier, their 18-year-old daughter, Amelia, would be babysitting Rosie and the four-year-old twins, Robert and Angelica. Amelia says that she put the three children to bed between 9 and 9.30 p.m. that night. She left the window open because it was hot in their basement apartment. I think we need to describe this basement apartment for those that have not experienced this, because this was something that was a little new to me. Right. So I've reviewed photos and I've spoke to people that have visited the crime scene and what they were able to tell me and what we are able to see from these photos is that the basement apartment is kind of what it says, where a portion of the, the apartment itself is below ground level but a portion of it is above ground level. So in this particular building, Captain, you have apartments on three levels. So they stack them three high, basically. You have a basement level, you have a mid-level, and then you have a top level. And in this apartment, they have two bedrooms in Rosie's apartment. It's one of the two-bedroom units. Right. So we have the parents sleeping in one bedroom, and the other bedroom, we have three of the children. We have Rosie and her two younger twin siblings. The 18-year-old daughter, Amelia, was sleeping on the couch. So Amelia lived there for a good period of time and then moved out and went and stayed with another relative for an extended period of time and came back to stay. And it sounds to me, Captain, like this was scheduled to be somewhat of a brief stay. I don't know if brief stay meant weeks or months, but it's always been reported as she was going to be living there briefly. So just sleeping on the couch now that she's back in their only two bedroom apartment, the basement level. So if you are inside this bedroom, inside of Rosie's bedroom, right? You and I, Captain, we're over six foot tall. You're taller than I am. If we were in there, we're giants. The window would start at about our chest level. If you were standing outside of the apartment, the window to that bedroom is only like six to eight inches off of the ground. Uh huh. So if somebody came in there in the middle of the night, like we all think happened, this did not require a bladder or any method of getting up to get into the window. You're actually getting down and crawling in. Right. So you don't need the ladder to get up into the window, but when you're coming down from the window, that conveniently you have that chest there. And so you'd have to have something to step down on because it'd be quite quite a long drop. When Luin and Roberto got home that night, they get home around 2.30 a.m. Luin says that she then went to the children's bedroom. She kisses them gently and she pulled the window closed. Remember, it's in the up position when she arrives. She pulls it closed, but this is not one of those windows, Captain, that we see typically today where it has the latch 
on the top of the bottom pane where you close it and then you twist it or turn it and it seals it and it locks it and you know it's locked. Right. This is those ones that you saw a lot in the 90s where they had the locks on the sides where you would push them in, open up the window, and then when you would pull it closed, it you would hear it click and it would lock and it would latch. Great sound effects. Now, Louine says that while she pulled it closed, she pulled it closed and she did not pull it tight. She was afraid that the clicking of that lock would wake up the children. Right. So as far as she's concerned, the window is closed, but not in the locked position. She also says that she closed the curtains to that window at that time. Now, here is where she becomes incredibly concerned because at 5.30 a.m., she wakes up. She's walking through the living room, but to her surprise, she can see that the children's door to the bedroom is now shut. Mm -hmm. She left it open when she went to bed. She goes inside the bedroom. She immediately notices that Rosie is gone and the window is open. The screen is removed and the Venetian blinds knocked to the floor. From my understanding of this crime scene here, Captain, it is exactly like what you said. There was some kind of marking on this screen that was placed outside of the apartment window and now leaning up against the apartment wall. There was markings on this screen that indicated that somebody used some kind of tool to pry the screen from the window. What's terrifying here, not only would this intruder need to climb down and use this chest as a stepping stool into the children's bedroom, But the positioning of the beds and where all the kids were sleeping, this individual would have had to crawl over one of the other children to get to Rosie. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of the Madeline McCann case where you have multiple kids in a room, but only one of them was abducted. And that's probably because if you you have only one individual, you can only carry so many children. But the the marking on the screen, it could be a nothing burger in the sense of that Rosie's sister would have her boyfriend sneak into that room and he would use the same window. So is it possible that these pry marks are from earlier events of the boyfriend sneaking into that window? Regardless of how they got the screen off, we know that the sc- screen was removed. Intruder climbs into the window crawls over another child to get to Rosie. What's difficult here though, Captain, I can see reasons why I would suspect maybe two persons were involved. I would like to know if they have any clue or any evidence to suggest how the intruder left the apartment. Because just because they gain access to the apartment through the child's bedroom does not mean that they had to exit that way as well. What we do have, as far as evidence goes, there are fingerprints on this screen. As the captain pointed out, these could be the offender's fingerprints. These could be maintenance workers' fingerprints. Could be the boyfriend. Could the be ex-boyfriend. the ex-boyfriend. The big piece of evidence here that we have in her bedroom is on that chest. There was a towel, and there's a footprint in the towel. That's a bit of a difficult thing. You're exactly right. They found a partial footprint in the room, in that bedroom. The difficult thing is how it's reported. It's been reported a couple of different ways. One on the towel on that chest leading up to the window. The other reports state that it was on the blinds, that it was found on the blinds. Now, could we have two partial footprints in the apartment? Possibly. Right. Or Somebody's just got some information wrong. The problem, too, with this case, Captain, that I don't love, and I think that the Salt Lake City Police have done a good job working this case, that they've at least spent a lot of time and resources on the case. I think that there's some crowdsourcing that they could be doing that they are not participating in. There, there's, a, there's information, there's meat on the bone here in this case, but they don't want to release hardly anything on Rosie's case. 
Well, the biggest problem right away is the size of the apartment complex and how many people we have living within that small area. So all those individuals become suspects. Upon discovering her daughter is missing, Louine then calls 911 and phones family members. And we have family members and police both on the scene who arrive to help to search. This is before dawn. We have police combing the banks of the Jordan River, and they drove through the neighborhood, of course. Family members posted flyers. They're already posting flyers at nearby convenience stores with Rosie's pictures. So we have two things going on. The police, they're thinking maybe this girl had wandered off. And immediately the parents are of the idea that she might have been abducted. Now, just by posting flyers doesn't mean that they believe 100% that she's abducted, just straight up missing. But what happens is they spring into action very quickly. Yeah, but you have to applaud them for that. She has her brother or brother-in-law who's at Kinko's nearby making flyers around 8 a.m. that morning. And he goes out with the sister-in-law and immediately starts posting these flyers everywhere that they can. Unfortunately, this is all for naught because a man by the name of Gustavo Abara was jogging with his dog and at 10, 15 a.m., according to this report, spots Rosie's body floating in a surplus canal at the 1900 block of West and 1200 block of South. Let's get into this investigation, or at least the information that's been released in this investigation. The autopsy report was completed within a couple of days of finding the little girl and officially listed the cause of death as drowning. But the case was ruled a homicide, as we said earlier, because trauma to Rosie's body would indicate that this is a homicide. Now, they state that trauma to Rosie's body was limited to wounds of a sexual nature in this report. She was not stabbed, nor was she beaten, according to this report, which is a little weird because a lot of the other reports do list blunt force trauma. Yeah, the majority of the reports that you read on this case list blunt force trauma so why wouldn't we think that there's trauma there uh, that that makes no sense to me again we can't prove one way or another because the autopsy report has never been revealed to the public we can simply go off of what persons who have reviewed those documents and what their statements are to the media well then the other question becomes because she's found in water and we know water is one of the it's a it's a horrible thing to find a body in water because it washes away so much evidence so with this sexual assault you you wonder if they have dna uh, of the murderer they've always been cagey about the dna and we'll get into that as we continue along but looking for physical evidence we know the investigators publicly have stated that they look for signs on rosie's mouth to see if it was taped shut to silence her They found no signs of her mouth being taped closed. They wondered if the killer may have used chloroform, a clear liquid that, if inhaled, can leave a victim unconscious. Unfortunately, the the river water would have washed away traces of that chemical. This is per the pathologist who performed the autopsy. And then as far as the family goes, this report, again, this is coming out less than a month after after the homicide and this report states that the tapia family members have been cooperating fully with police they have provided fingerprints to match against those lifted from rosie's window and have even found clues in rosie's room that they provided to police yeah if you're in law enforcement you have to look at this case from the inside out so you want to start going through the timeline of her her father her mother her older sister and then you wonder, were there visitors to the older sister, and is she is she telling the full story about what her events were that night? This gets difficult, too. Unfortunately, the oldest sister, Amelia, has passed away. She passed away just a couple of years ago. So she was involved in this case, and she was up front and center for a lot of the media attention that was given to this case. Let's go through the reports first, because there were reports that came out years later that had some speculation in it that Amelia may have thrown a party or had a gathering at the apartment that night. 
before Rosie goes missing. The speculation was that maybe one of the attendees of that gathering took the girl. There's a couple problems with that. Well, first off, we have the mother who says that she physically saw and kissed the girl goodnight when she arrived at 2.30 in the morning. Right, and there's no reason not to believe her. Also, we have police that went on the record after this rumor starts going about and made its way to the paper. The police, they're not very upfront and center about a lot of things in this case, but one thing they were was regarding this this air quotes party that did not happen. They said they they spoke to a lot of people. They could find no evidence that such a party took place. Now, if somehow this party managed to happen and nobody was aware of it, that the police found no evidence and mom and dad does not believe that a party happened, if it managed to fly that far under the radar, well, then that would mean that if one of the attendees is responsible, then they came back and entered the apartment through the window. They didn't take the girl on their way out the door from the party because Louine tells us the girl was there. She was present at 2.30 in the morning when I arrived home. Now, police have said emphatically that the time frame that they are concerned about here in Rosie Tapia's case is that 2.30 a.m. window to 5.30 a.m. window. We got a three-hour time frame that they are concerned of. And they believe that that is the time frame in which Rosie Tapia was abducted. I wish that they were able to narrow it down even more than that three hours, but that is what we are currently left with. Right. Now, as far as eyewitnesses go, we have some, and their stories are a little difficult because some of these people come forward years later. But one potential witness statement that we have comes from Robert, Rosie's little brother, who was asleep in the same bedroom as her that night. Right. He gave a statement that he may have seen someone in their room that night. Yeah, but this statement wasn't made right away. He tells this to the parents, who then relay this to the police. Now, I'm a little hesitant to report on this because it's been reported so many different ways that I have a bit of a a lot of question marks about this statement. First off, it's coming from a four-year-old child. We do not know exactly what he saw because the reports vary. The other thing, too, could some of this be from his imagination after the fact because now he's terrified and likely having nightmares because he slept in the same room where his sister was abducted from. Well, the statement was something that there was a bearded man that told him to go back to sleep. Bearded man that told him to go back to sleep. It makes sense that Robert would have a statement compared to his twin sister because that was the bed. Robert's bed was the one that the perpetrator would have had to climb over to get to Rosie. But just so we're clear, you're saying that this statement was made immediately to police where I thought this was made years later. The way it's been, the from my understanding, I should, I should say that because it's been reported different ways. My understanding is that the child told mom and dad about this relatively quickly mm. in the investigation. I believe it was within days of them finding Rosie's body and that the parents relayed this statement to the police. Now, I spoke with somebody that's very close to the case and very close to the family, and they gave me a much different story than what's been reported. Because I asked, I said, was there any witness statements? Was there anything that the other two siblings may have seen that night? And I was told that Robert did say that he saw a man in their room. I said, was there anything distinctive about the individual that he saw? Was there any identifiers that the child was able to provide regarding the man that he may have seen in the room that night? And this individual told me that the man... Robert reported that the man had hair on his arms, nothing about a beard. Hmm. So while a beard might be helpful, I think hair on your arms would be much less helpful as most people have hair on their arms. One thing that was a little bit of a speed bump, though, was that Robert referred to this man as the Coco Man, 
which I think was misinterpreted by police that we could be dealing with a person of color, possibly an African-American man. Right. However, in Spanish culture, the Coco Man is similar to the Boogeyman. Right. It has nothing to do with the color of an individual. Well, I think it would also be very difficult in the dark. This murderer is climbing over the bed. Maybe his arms are close to Robert at the time, so that's why he saw the hair. But maybe that's why he can't find, couldn't see other details because it's dark in that room. And I don't want to question a victim here, and I believe this little boy is simply trying to help. But it also could be simply put that he's had some nightmares since the situation and tells parents, I saw the boogeyman. I saw the bad man that took my sister. Yeah, because one of the reports I was reading stated that there was no eyewitnesses or no credible eyewitnesses initially and that the, the twin siblings had nothing to report to police. But again, you know, that's why we have to dive into multiple reports because sometimes it's just bad reporting. The other thing to keep in mind though, too, is that we are dealing with a situation where nobody knows 100% what happened for a couple of days. It wasn't until the conclusion of the autopsy, which took a couple of days after the body was recovered to make this determination of homicide. Well, then we also have an eyewitness that saw a a teenager by the canal. Yes, this person that was seen by the canal is later referred to as wet pants man because the witness says that they saw this person, the witness, was up early that morning, was outside, and says that they saw a truck, a white truck, and the truck drives off and then later sees a person who we're calling wet pants man. And they describe this individual as a Hispanic male with slight build, possibly 16 to 17 years of age with short, dark hair. And the eyewitness is a neighbor of the Tapias. Yeah. I believe at first, uh, they were stating, oh, okay, he's wearing a white shirt. And he wear, He's wearing multicolored pants. But as they got closer, they're like, oh, that's not multiple colored pants. Just the bottom of his pants are wet, meaning that he probably was in the canal at some point. Which is interesting because that's one of the few facts that comes out about the autopsy. The, the investigators are stating that they have evidence that she wasn't thrown from the shore into the surplus canal that she was held down and drowned in the water. So this is going to make a lot of sense when we go through some other facts of that day, after they recover the body, police and search teams are still doing the hard work. They're still trying to piece everything together because they need to know the full story of what happened. So they bring out bloodhounds to try to discern where this girl entered the water. Right. Mind you, they're still under the impression that there's a possibility that this is just simply an accident, that she wandered off and went into the water. Now, the bloodhounds are unable to hit on anywhere, providing them a location of where the girl may have walked into the water. Interesting. So this would go back to things that we've reviewed in other cases, right? Oftentimes they say when, when dogs follow a scent and then they stop, especially when that scent leads them to the edge of a road. Once they stop, that's an indicator to police and investigators that the victim then got into a vehicle and the vehicle drove off. Here, we have the bloodhounds unable to tell us where the girl went into the water. And based off of what they're saying about the autopsy, that she was held down in the water, that indicates that the perpetrator's in the water with the victim. It also indicates to me, based off of the lack of information from the scent dogs, that the perpetrator carried her into the water. Yeah, which would make a lot of sense. And and but first of all, yeah, I hate that we call him what pants man because that was my nickname in kindergarten. And if pee in your pants is cool, then consider me Miles Davis. But yeah, I I think if anybody wants to go online, there is a map 
of the apartment complex and this canal. And the canal doesn't run, you know, parallel or perpendicular. It's coming at an angle. So where this eyewitness was seen or roughly where he was seen is the closest entrance point to the canal from the apartment complex. Now she's found a little bit further down, but you would expect that once she's in that canal that she would have moved around a little bit. Captain, we keep citing this article here, and I want to point something out here. There's some disappointing angles to this case and this investigation. I was a little shocked because if you get online today and you hunt Rosie Tapia, there is, Captain's favorite word, a plethora. Would you say I have a plethora? I would say we have a a plethora of stories regarding Rosie's case today as we sit in 2023. However, back in 1995, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, I can't count above 2000, so we'll stop there. Okay. There was not a plethora. In fact, there were very few local newspaper articles regarding this case. There is one, though, that is key and paramount to our storytelling, and that is the one that we referenced already. It's the September 10th, 1995 Salt Lake Tribune article, and guess what? It was written by your boy, Joshua B. Good. Parents out there, if your last name is Good, you should always name your son. Related to Johnny B. Good. Yeah, middle Mm -hmm. name Benjamin fits every single time. Now, this article is interesting because there's not a whole lot of information. There's not a whole lot of articles that come out. In fact, this is just simply one of a few that ran for the first five years locally in this case. But this article itself is multiple pages. It's pretty in depth. It's pretty detailed and it's pretty thorough. One thing I loved about this newspaper article is, And had I been reading it in September of 1995 when the article came out, I would have had high hopes to solve this case because they brought in a guy named Kenneth Lanning from the FBI. And in the article, they state that the victim was thrown into the river. Of course, later we would learn from future information that comes out that the victim was actually held down. And we just went through the whole scenario of why we believe she would have been carried in to the canal going along with this witness statement of wet pants, man. The article states that the FBI was working on a psychological profile of the killer, that the FBI would be pouring over recent burglary reports. They would be reviewing recent paroled child molesters that were paroled in the state of Utah. The article goes on to state and remind us all that child abductions by strangers are rare Only about 1% of kidnappings a year fall into that category. And they also point out that entering a child's home to abduct the child through a window is even more uncommon. Well, I know that there's been some criticism of this investigation, but I always like it when they ask for help. And we got the FBI, the MFFBI, and it's not just any agent. We have Kenneth Lanning there. Right. And as said, had I been reading this article in 1995, I would have had high hopes that this thing would have been solved because Kenneth Lanning is extremely capable and experienced at solving this type of crime. He's brought in to review the burglary reports, review the recent parolees in the state of Utah. He's going to go through the crime scene. He's going to go through the police report. In fact, we recommended one of his books before in a recommended segment on this very show, his book is titled Love, Bombs, and Molesters. Bombs and Molesters were two of his uh, areas of expertise during his time with the FBI. The motherfucking FBI. Unfortunately, a couple things happen here, Captain. We're told by law enforcement that there was a psychological profile, an offender profile that was put together by the FBI, by the Behavioral Science Unit of the FBI that profile has never been released to the public. It's not uncommon to not, which is great. Think about it. (laughs) 
some of our tax dollars go to the FBI, right? Well, yes, uh, and to the the law enforcement agency investigating Rosie right. Tapia. So, so we have a a, a six year old that was abducted, a sexually assault, possibly bu- brutally beaten and drowned, and for like you said, probably forcibly drowned in this canal. So we should have a community that's going, hey, we 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 want this solved. And and not just uh, for the justice of her family and the justice of the community, but the safety of our community and the safety of our children. And you guys did a profile, and you guys don't even want to tell us about it? Yeah, and to so to back up the FBI on this situation, they had very minor involvement in the Rosie Tapia case. And we're being told that there was a profile that was provided to police from the FBI. That statement comes from the police. The choosing to not release that profile comes from the police, the investigating agency that's what in charge. What are we paying you guys for? Of the case. Now, I want I want to defend everybody here. I think that it is a bit of a misstep to not release some of the information from a profile. In fact, that's actually what the public sees most of the time. There's been profiles done on multiple killers throughout the years, and the profiles have never been released to the public. There's also been profiles done on killers where they release a portion of the profile. I can see, without going into great detail here, Captain, I can see reasons why you would not want to release the profile in its entirety because of things that I suspect may be in the profile. However, I think that there are things that you could release to the public that would help your investigation. I think that there are things in that profile that once released to the public could hurt the investigation. So I get it, but I also think that you could release a portion of that profile. One thing that caught my eye in that article in particular was that can the, the FBI and agent Lanning would be reviewing and pouring over recent burglary reports. The reason why I thought that was interesting was because given the nature of this crime, we know there was an intruder. We know somebody came into the home and removed the victim from the home, and she's later found dead. When we spoke with retired FBI agent Jeffrey Reinick, he explained to us that it's very common to find serial rapists, or abductors through these burglary reports because oftentimes they will get arrested for what is misinterpreted as a potential burglary. They break into the home and the homeowner is able to stop them or police arrive on the scene and catch the assailant fleeing from the home and the individuals arrested and charged with burglary yeah or the, it's criminal escalation you have peeping toms that decide that they want to then start en- entering homes and then once they're entering homes and then then it's more likely you know, once they get comfortable with entering the homes that they would then uh, abduct a victim correct but you're looking for somebody that's already passed that escalation if if that is the if, if that's the route that this criminal behavior took what i'm simply saying is what jeffrey reinick was saying was that oftentimes these individuals who have already escalated to that are picked up on burglary charges because what do they have to do to carry out the rape or the abduction they have to enter the home and when they are arrested it's misinterpreted their intent for being in the home as burglary So very interesting that they poured over this. But again, in this situation with the paroled child molesters from the state of Utah, as well as these burglary reports, we don't get any follow up information. want to thank everybody for joining us here in the garage if you're looking for the first 50 episodes those are now only available on our website store so check those out thanks for joining us so much more to get to in this case join us back here in the garage same bat time same bat channel 
And until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.